G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. We are back for 2020. As you should all know, we intend to keep going with the content all through the summer. And today in this video, I'm actually gonna take you through some early predictions for the 2020 AFL season. Now these won't be my final predictions. I think me and the boys will get together towards the start of round one, maybe after the preseason, and we'll do our proper predictions then. But today we're just gonna have an early look based on what I'm feeling right now. So I'm gonna go with the standard format and start at eight and go team by team all the way to who I think will win the premiership. Start off, and this is an easy one, I'm gonna go with the Gold Coast Suns finishing 18th. I think they had a really positive off season. I think what they lacked throughout this year was not so much young talent or anything like that, but more some mature quality to get them through the whole season without getting knackered. They've added to that with Greenwood, Ellis, and uh, to a lesser extent, Zach Smith joining the club or rejoining the club in the case of Smith. That means they've got a few more mature bodies on the list to help protect that young talent and they've added to that young talent this year as well with Raul and Anderson through the draft, adding to King, Lukosius, and Rankin last year. And I'm starting to see that the future might be a little bit bright at the Suns. No pun intended. Overall, moving in the right direction, but not moving up the ladder just yet. 17th is a real curly one for me, and that's the Sydney Swans. Now I know there's some Sydney fans on here that won't be happy with that, but it's on the basis that they've lost a lot of experience. Grundy, Jack, McVeigh, Smith, and Jones have all left their list, and they've only gained Taylor, Brand, and Sam Gray, who I think they can turn into good role players, but nonetheless, I don't think that's enough short-term quality for them to really rise up the ladder. They're in a massive transitional period at the moment. I really, really rate their young talent, but I think they're gonna do that thing where they blood the young players as much as they can. But Buddy Franklin, for me, is the real question mark. If he plays a lot of games, they definitely won't finish bottom two. So his health is a massive question right. mark. If they play the youth like I expect them to, I think they might finish bottom two. 16th spot is Carlton, and I think I'll probably cop some flack for this one too. When Teague took over, they started playing their plays in the right positions to really sort of improve in the short term, and that showed. They won like, what was it, five games after Teague took over? Nonetheless, I still think there's still a lot of youth on the list that will need time to develop, even Sam Walsh. I'd be surprised if he puts together a season as good as his first one in his second year. They're still gonna need to continue to expose those younger guys, and as such, I can see them stagnating a little bit before they move up in a couple years. It was a quiet sort of off season for Carlton. Yes, they missed out on Papley, but they did add Jack Martin, Eddie Betts, who I think will improve their forward line in the short term. There's a little bit of a question mark for me on Jack Martin. We know he's a super talent, but is Carlton the best club he could go to to really reach his potential? I'm not so sure. Similar to this year, I'm expecting Carlton to play flashes some really good football, but not enough to actually get enough wins to move up the ladder. In 15th spot and rounding out my bottom four, I've picked the Adelaide Crows. Again, this is a tough one for me. I don't really like putting the Crows that low. I do think there's still a lot of quality on the list. They have cleaned out a fair bit of experience. They've lost Keith, Ellis Yolman, Greenwood, Betts, Jacobs, and Jenkins, and none of those are star players, but you add it all up and it actually becomes a fair bit of experience and depth on the list. That and the fact that they've drafted heavy in the last couple of years means there's a lot of young talent on the list they're gonna to need to exposed and similar to Sydney like I said before they're gonna to have to blood those kids at every opportunity and as such I think they'll drop games as a result nothing too drastic but enough to drop down the ladder by two or three spots 14 is another tough one for me and I've gone with North Melbourne which might seem a little bit harsh but I just expect them to not necessarily improve or decline this year another team with a pretty quiet offseason they lost Scott Thompson to retirement and they've added Aiden Bonner from GWS who's a good long-term inside mid talent but overall, it's hard to see them really doing much to improve next year. The off-season strategy was interesting. There was a bit of a money ball selection, A, picking up Bonner, and B, trading away their first rounder to trade into next year's draft. Again, it might be a good move in terms of numbers, but I do wonder if North should have been a little bit more proactive in this off-season to try and improve their list. For me, I'm not sure where the upside comes this year. I expect guys like Simpkin and LDU in particular to probably take the next step, but you've already got the older guys like Cunnington, Brown, and Higgins. Brown's not really old, but nonetheless, they're all playing really top quality football. So I'm not sure where that improvement comes from next year. So I expect them to stagnate and finish 14. 13th spot, I've got St. Kilda and that will also ruffle a few feathers, I think. They did have a bumper off season this year, picking up five best of the 22 players. They added Brad Hill, Paddy Ryder, Zach Jones, Dougal Howard, and Dan Butler. Nonetheless, I think their list is still a little bit vanilla. In fact, I've said it before, I think Brad Hill actually automatically becomes their best player. They also lost Jack Steven, Armitage, Akers, and Bruce to trades or retirement. I do know that St. Kilda were hit hard with the injury stick last year and added to those five players 
coming into the side. There's a lot of reason to expect them to move up the ladder. Nonetheless, I still look at their best 22 and it's hard to see them being better some, than some other teams around that range. So I've got them in 13th, playing better football, but ultimately still finishing around the same spot. In 12th spot, I've got a bit of a surprise. I'm gonna go with Essendon here. Looking at a few articles recently, it sounds like they've only got half their squad playing and training in the off season so far. Uh, and I know it's only December, but I've got a lot of injuries. It's really hard to quantify exactly the effect that will have on the squad, but Essendon as well is a little bit of a mentally fragile side, I reckon, in the last couple of years. They've also got the question mark of the succession plan and Woosher being out the door next year, I'll find that all kind of weird. Um, I This is my roughie, but I think they might not quite do a Melbourne and fall to the bottom two, but I think they'll underachieve this year and Woosh will go out in a bit of a low. And then next year or the following year, uh, Rutten will take over and maybe we'll see some improvement there. 11 spot, I am going with the Fremantle Dockers. And this is a little bit of a surprise because this would mean they've improved despite losing one of their best players in Brad Hill. They lost Hill, Langdon and Sanderlands to retirement this off season and they desperately lack outside run. But other than that, I actually think their list is fairly well balanced. Their backline in particular is really strong, in my opinion. It's just been injuries that have held them back. In particular, Alex Pierce is probably one of the best defenders in the league on his day. So, if they've added Hayden Young and Liam Henry, Hayden Young in particular, I think, can come into that side straight away, and I expect him to contend for the rising star. Um, on the back of a better injury run, which again, is fingers crossed for them, um, and that excellent defense, I think they'll improve this year, but the inconsistency of adjusting to a new coach means they won't win enough games for finals. So I'm gonna go with 11th. 10th is the enigmatic Melbourne, and there's a few of us who don't quite know where to peg Melbourne this year. The strength of their best 22 is good enough, I think. I think we all saw that in 2018 when they made a prelim. I don't think it was a fluke, and a lot of that talent that was driving that improvement was young. So, assuming they get a better injury run, I expect them to improve, but again, it's like Essendon. I'm not convinced by their sort of mental fragility. Melbourne are a side that kind of dropped their bundle. I know it's a new club than it was maybe five or so years ago, but for me, I think they'll be inconsistent. I think we'll see flashes of brilliance from their best players. I expect Brayshaw to come back stronger this year. Clayton Oliver is obviously a gun. I think they'll just do enough to improve, but not make finals and they'll finish 10th. In ninth spot in no man's land, I've got Port Adelaide. This will mean they'll kind of have a similar year to the last couple of years, but this year, maybe it'll be sort of like 2019 where it's quite intentional. They're blooding a lot of youth. They've taken seven picks in the top 25 in the last two years. There is a lot of youth in that side, a lot of talent, particularly in that front half, and I expect them to get a fair few opportunities this year. And the rest of the side is still good enough. You've got Robbie Gray, Rockliffe Boak. Those guys are a little bit older, but nonetheless still playing good football. I think in typical Port fashion, they'll do enough to beat some really good teams this year and then lose some disappointing games, and they'll improve, but still miss out on finals and finish ninth. And my other prediction for them is their ninth place finish will mean that Ken Hinckley is out of a job at the end of the year. In eighth spot, in the first final spot, I've got Hawthorne. Tom Mitchell returns this year, and while I don't know how long it'll take for him to get to his best, it sounds like that leg break was pretty devastating. Uh, he still improves the side. Their best football is impressive. We saw what they did in Perth in the final round of the year against West Coast. Maybe their issues with their best 22 were probably forward and back, particularly in key position stocks, where they've added Sam Frost and Jonathan Patton, neither of whom are really, really good players, but you expect that Clarkson and that Hawthorne system could turn them into good role players. And on that basis, I think they'll improve and I, I think they'll make finals. They're a good enough team to make finals. Seventh spot, I've got the Brisbane Lions, which is a bit of a dip. I do rate their squad. It is good enough to make the top four. And to be fair to them, their offseason only consolidated that. They added Cam ellis Yeoman as that big-bodied midfielder, and they got in virtual as that experienced defender to replace Luke Hodge. Nonetheless, though, they are a young side, and going out in straight sets twice in two home games last year uh, might have a little bit of a mental effect on them. So while this is all a little bit wishy-washy and it's not a great reason to rate them down, I just think they might do what young sides often do and bounce before they come back up in a couple of years. I think they'll finish seventh. In sixth spot, I've got the Geelong Cats. And the big question for these guys is, 
How well can they cover the loss of Tim Kelly, who is one of their best players over the last two years, really, but particularly the last year? They're a very mature team, and they've just added Jack Steven and Josh Jenkins, who admittedly are old and kind of only add to that problem. But in terms of just this year, they're good enough to make an impact. Stevens in particular, although while he's taken some time out from the game and you can't necessarily rely on him to play 22 games next year, when he does play, he is good enough to make a strong impact and I can just see him doing really well at Geelong. For me, I still think their squad is good enough to contend, but the fact that their squad is all a year older now and while they've got a good sort of crop of young players, the, team, the side that they rely on to play each week is getting on guys like Selwood, Taylor, even to a lesser extent, Dangerfield. For me, I'm a discriminating a little bit on age, but I think they'll miss out on the four and come sixth, but I wouldn't be surprised if they finish higher. In fifth spot, I've got everyone's favorite dark horse, the Western Bulldogs. Now, undeniably, this side has always been quality over the last three or four years, really. They, uh, they shouldn't have dipped down the ladder like they have. Their squad is strong. Their best top talent is really, really good, particularly in that midfield. They've got Bont, McRae, Dunkley, and Hunter feeding the ball to a youngster in Aaron Norton. There is a lot of firepower in that team. But they're a little bit of an unpredictable team, hard to rely on them. Obviously, even in the flag year, they didn't make the top four, so it's hard to peg them too high. But the squad is experienced now, their finals hardened. They've also consolidated some weaknesses in the list, forward and back by adding Josh Bruce and Alex Keith, which I think is much needed. As a result, with the squad a little more mature than it was in previous years, I think they're good enough to finish fifth. In fourth spot, we've got Collingwood, who are another team Team who had a quiet off season. In fact, their hands may be tied a little bit with salary cap. We saw them make some salary cap motivated moves. James A's joined Fremantle, which was a big surprise, which is pretty much a salary cap dump. Wells and Goldsack also departed the club. Uh, in bad news for them, it looks like Dane Beams is injured indefinitely, he's taking an indefinite break from football. Uh, so we don't know what will happen there. But nonetheless, I think the team's quality, there's still a lot of firepower. They don't necessarily have a real good key forward, but with guys like Majacek, Stevenson, and Goey up forward, they're still very hard to defend. Last year, they didn't reach top gear, in my opinion. They didn't play their absolute best football at really any point, and they still really, really got close to making a grand final. So in my opinion, they're clearly a top 14. In third spot, we've got my beloved West Coast Eagles, and this is always tough for me to peg. Last year, we finished fifth and probably underachieved. They picked up the biggest signing from this year's offseason in Geelong's Tim Kelly, and that has people wondering if West Coast now boasts the best midfield in the competition. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but nonetheless, I think he is a really, really good addition to what is already a strong team. It's undeniable. Pretty, that plus, I'm pretty bullish about Josh Kennedy's having his first preseason in three years. Last year, he basically played off one leg and still kicked 40 to 50 goals and still a good contributor. I'm expecting a little bit of, of a swan song from him and he'll contribute well he's this year. A, Nick Nadnu is also a virtual recruit for the club and while I know he's not necessarily one of the absolute best rucks in the game, when you compare it to Hickey and Vardy who would otherwise be a ruck combination, it's still a big improvement and that X factor means a lot. On the downside, I do think Willy Rioli is going to be an underrated loss this year and I really hope he hasn't played his last game for the club. Uh, but nonetheless, the Eagles have good forward talent coming through the ranks in guys like Petrocelli and Jared Cameron. Long story short, I think the Eagles will be up there this year, but not necessarily finish top two. In second spot, I have picked the reigning premiers, Richmond Tigers. I still expect them to be the best team in the competition next year, but I think they might do a Hawthorne and not actually finish first, but still be the best team. In fact, that is exactly what they did in 2019. We all know that Rands has now retired from the club, but we saw that in 2019, they didn't even really need him with Dylan Grimes being an absolute stalwart in the back line. They've also lost a little bit of depth. Sean Grigg has retired. Dan Butler's joined the Saints and Brandon Ellis made his way to the Gold Coast. Nonetheless, I still think Richmond squad is strong enough that we won't really see too much of a blip in the radar. People are also talking up the addition of Marlon Pickett, who's basically played one game. And while he played very well, that was probably the easiest game he could have debuted in. I know it was a grand final, but GWS basically didn't even show up to the game. I think he'll be a really good player, but if people are talking him up as the next Tim Kelly, I don't really see it. But nonetheless, he is strong depth added to an already strong team. So yes, Richmond top two and still the team to beat. In top spot, I've got the GWS Giants and I'm a little iffy with this one as well because we've seen what happens to teams who get belted in finals, let alone grand finals. They generally don't back it up the next year. However, I can only look at this objectively and GWS clearly have the best talent in the league. And what's more, it's all sort of in that 25 to 27 age group now. A lot of those guys like Cornelio, Whitfield, Green, 
um, Taranto, Jeremy Cameron. These guys are really only just starting to show what they can produce at this level. Nonetheless, having said that, on talent, they may be the best team but I still don't actually expect them to win the premiership this year. I think Richmond and West Coast have better systems. And while GWS will probably be the best home and away team, I think when it comes to the finals, West Coast and Richmond will prove themselves to be the best two teams. And I expect a Richmond West Coast grand final. And unfortunately, I'm going to say I'd probably zip Richmond. So that means Richmond may go back to back this year, which is really depressing. But to be honest, it is a safe conservative tip. As for the Brownlow this year, I want to say Nat Fife again, but he's such a question mark in terms of playing every game he probably needs to play 19 to 20 games to win the brown low uh, so i don't know if i'd bet on that so i'm going to say paddy cripps takes home his first charlie this year as for the rising star i did say it in the podcast the other day but i'm going to pick Lockie ash to come in and play well in an established side i think he's good enough to play early and he's got the speed and skill to shine early as well and in second place i'm actually going to have hayden young from Fremantle, I think he's ready to go. A real dark horse that I also really like for the Rising Star is Sydney's Dylan Stevens. I think he'll play early and he, again, like Ash, is good enough to get games and play well given his speed and skill. But that's it, guys. That's all the predictions I have for you right now. As I said, when it gets closer to the season, maybe around the preseason time, we'll start making more serious predictions and we'll have more content like that coming up. Well, I've got you here. This is one of our first videos for 2020. And I do want to just say thank you for 2019. It's unbelievable to think where the channel was at the end of 2018 compared to where it is now. To think that was all one year is ridiculous. So I just want to say thank you. We're all so grateful uh, because obviously we couldn't do it without you guys. Stick around for the summer with the boys. We're going to be doing some Big Bash League live streams. We've been talking about it, but haven't got a chance to do it just yet. But that will be on the cards soon. We're going to keep going with the podcast as well. And I'm going to do some other creative stuff, maybe like mini documentaries or even go back to those team-based videos that I was doing last year. But anyway, guys, if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe. If you're not new to the channel, uh, just you know, hit the like button or something. Who knows? But thank you for watching, guys. I'll see you all very soon somewhere on YouTube. Cheers.